welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. And uh, the title of this uh, discussion uh, today is Navigating the New Normal, uh, Addressing School Challenges Post-COVID-19. Um, and we're very lucky to be joined by three school leaders from around the country. Uh, we have Laura Butcher, Principal of St. John's C of E Primary School in Wigan, uh, which is part of the Keys Federation. Uh, Mark Tilling, Head Teacher, from High Tunstall College of Science in Hartlepool, and Nick Ford, Deputy Head of Bolton School, an independent day school in Bolton. Um, and let's just jump straight in. I think that would make the most sense. Um, I think the most important question to ask the three of you to start with is, what has your school been doing to maintain teaching and learning during lockdown? And Laura, if you're happy to start, um, we'll go straight over to you. Absolutely. Well, we've done some core things initially. What we wanted to do really was maintain the routines for our children and our families um, in terms of learning. So we uploaded learning daily to the online platforms. For us with Century, our children were already used to the teachers assigning them nuggets and them using that platform for learning within year three, year four, year five and year six for reading, for maths, for science. So for us, they were already accustomed at using that so we could use it in that way. Also, the children could use the artificial intelligence as part of the learning pathway and they're accustomed to looking at their dashboards to see what their strengths are and their areas for development. Um, our teachers, to just remain that sense of community, have pre-recorded videos and uploaded that kind of human interaction to guide the learning. So we did that and for us, because we've worked quite digitally over the last few years, we found a 70 to 80 percent attendance for all our children accessing their kind of full entitlement to learning over that time. That's amazing. And I guess then, had you anticipated it would be that high? And I guess the other part of that question is, what about then the, the 20 percent as well? Yeah, so... I don't think we, any of us knew in the short time frame that we mm. had to put something together, uh, get it out there, have our teachers working in this way remotely at home, um, and then expecting parents who are still working from home, because everybody was working from home and then homeschooling. Um, mm. No, we didn't expect it to be as high, but really pleased that it is. Um, with that kind of bottom 20%, what we've done is we contact them. So we still have regular contact with our families. So anybody that had issues with technology, we would give them IT loans um, so they could borrow some equipment from school. Uh, or if they didn't have any access to technology, didn't have kind of the Wi-Fi's at home or didn't want to, we gave them their own learning packs as in a traditional way in terms of paper format for them to be able to access uh, a, a, an ongoing curriculum. Excellent. Lovely. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. Um, and then the same question over to Mark. Um, what has your school been doing to maintain the teaching and learning during this very difficult time? Thanks, Will. It's, it's, it's been a challenge for us, if I'm, if I'm honest. We, we hadn't invested an awful lot in technology before lockdown. Uh, we moved into a fabulous new building in November and had concentrated on, on moving a 1300 school uh, from one building to another. And that was quite a logistical challenge in its own. But in January, we, we invested in Century Tech and, uh, and some other platforms, but mainly Century Tech to deliver uh, maths, English and science in terms of uh, independent learning opportunities, homework. And we'd rolled it out in, in February to year seven and started very small. And then suddenly, as the pandemic started to grow, you could see something was going that uh, I made the decision very quickly to roll it right out through the school. And so when, when we did close on the 23rd of March, um, every child was asked to go on to the centre for the first two or three weeks, purely just on that platform. While we got other things sorted as we went, went along. What we quickly discovered was 40% of our kids were finding it hard to establish online learning because either lack of Wi-Fi or equipment or just lack of equipment because the parents are at home and the rest of it. So we had to adapt mm. to some paper format. But certainly on the 60% on the that are regularly uh, accessing online, the children really have engaged the programme really, really well, uh, engaged the online learning really well. We haven't gone for online uh, live lessons with our teachers yet. That's something we haven't trained them for. It's something we haven't done the safeguarding around. Um, so what Central Tech has enabled us to do is make sure that they've got an access to a platform which enables them to follow a pathway of learning. 
And uh, what we're doing now is making sure we're planning ready for September, looking at the nuggets of young people completed, making sure we understand what the, the success rate's been, making sure that's being planned and part of our curriculum for all four years, we should be using it moving forward. Excellent. It's a really interesting point you mentioned, and we'll bring this up later, the training for the new skills that teachers are going to need to, to have now, as you said, the live lessons. So I'll be sure to bring that up again when we talk later on. And I'll take that question over to you as well, Nick, then. Um, how has your school maintained teaching and learning during um, the lockdown? Um, so we've been very lucky. Um, you know, we've been preparing for this for years in a lot of ways because we've been fully one-to-one -one with iPads for, you know, for five years, uh, six years, actually, across some parts of the school. Um, so a lot of our staff and our students already have the tools in order to be able to, you know, to make remote learning work. Um, obviously, one of the key things is that we were lucky that we anticipated this. So we've been running a full timetable. As Laura said, the routine's really important. So, you know, mm -hmm. our boys register as they would normally at, this, at the normal time. You know, we have, you know, attendance has been as it would be normally in school. You know, they are up, they're learning. Uh, and we've run a full timetable and you know we told our staff and we trained our staff before we went into lockdown to either be doing synchronous or live lessons or you know asynchronous pre-recorded lessons particularly for GCSE and A-level groups and then a sort of a blended approach further down the school of yeah you know, sort of like you know, some live lessons some you know recorded lessons some you know project-based work and actually sort of like really focusing on the teaching and learning you know we've had a very much a blended approach looking at you know, sort of using you know, zoom for some live lessons you know, explain everything for recorded lessons but also you know again having had century for you know sort of six months at that point you know the whole school was already using that and that's enabled us to work really well with um, intervention so when we're identifying those gaps in learning which the students struggle with not having that interaction with the teacher you know century is there to help plug some of those gaps yeah, it, it, you're right. It's fascinating that it, if you had platforms or your staff were ready with technology, then you'd definitely find yourself in a much easier place. Um, because, I mean, everyone around the country is obviously very shocked about what to do next. Um, and it kind of leads into the second question um, for you all to consider, which is, how has the use of technology in education been impacted? Um, and a couple of things maybe to think about when answering this is, I think you've all touched on this, that perhaps your staff were using a mixture of technology, if that helped or, it, or didn't or had the opposite effect. Um, risks and concerns potentially about teachers delivering live lessons um, and also not necessarily just having technology or platforms, but how can your teachers trust the content that's on these platforms as it, it, they were taking over such a significant role now um, in the learning of students? And um, Laura, should we start with you on that? Yeah, um, I think for some schools and, and the three of us here are good examples of different stages of kind of using technology within teaching and learning and having an online curriculum. Um, so I think if you've got a staff that are responsive to the change and for some of our staff, even though they do use it within Key Stage 1, obviously Century is Key Stage 2 based, our Key Stage 1 staff were catapulted into a world of using the online platforms and we do use um, s some other online platforms um, as well as Century um, but our staff have taken that on board uh, um, and used it but you know, we need to make sure that we keep it simple so where you're talking about using the trusted content for mm. us is we already have online platforms that we either pay a subscription for or no the way that we know that they're trusted is we do our educational research, we collaborate with other schools, we go on forums, we talk to people to find those things and have like systems and protocol in place to check the content before you would share the link with the children. Um, a bit like you have your uh, filters within school anyway on your technology systems to 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 sort out any content. Um, but that's how we did it. So. We know like with the Oak National Academy and the BBC bite size things, and it's using the guidance from the DFE, for example, uh, they obviously have let us know what some of those trusted content is as well. One thing we didn't choose to do was live lessons. Uh, we didn't feel that we needed it initially, um, 
but it but it's a risk life's a risk isn't it everything has got a risk around it and it's ensuring that you communicate well with your parents children staff so that they everybody knows what to expect in terms of an online live delivery of lesson as well as pre-recorded so that's what what i would say we've done over here no absolutely it's fascinating and when you say about the live lessons that you came to the decision not to is that a decision that might change now going forward um or to something you're thinking about perhaps upskilling teachers in or in, would you have the processes embedded now yeah i think it's something that we would consider doing and um, we would have to really look at what our protocols are like i said in sharing that um, idea of how we'd communicate that because it's it's safeguarding for all isn't it safeguarding comes first and foremost and we need to mm -hmm. safeguard the staff the families the children everybody um, but it's just making sure protocols are in place so it is something we're considering and a bit like nick school over in bolton we're also moving because of what's happened because of the pandemic it's kind of accelerated our digital strategy that's been in place over the last few years and we're looking at moving to the one-to-one -one devices for september so again alongside that live lessons we could look at it from that point of view then excellent uh, brilliant thank you laura um over to you mark then again with the question um how the use of technology has been impacted i think we were starting from a, a not a low base because we've always used technology in schools just haven't used it between home and schools much we've gone down a big mm -hmm. line of using uh, a platform for homework and, and all, all those sort of things in the last two three years what this has done to us has made made us realise that actually to meet the diverse needs of our population and, and we serve some of the most deprived wards in the country in Hartlepool, that we actually need to make sure we've got things available for everybody. Um, we, we like the use of technology. I think there's a, a, some things that we've got to get our teachers to trust what it is they're getting and, and, and understand the new, t the new tools we're using. And that's been a challenge in some places because it's nothing like a teacher saying that something's not good enough or it doesn't have what this on it, uh, or they don't cover this bit of content. Well, actually, it's one part of the tool is what we're saying to them. Use it for what's best for you, but let's use this platform. Um, we, we made a very clear decision not to do live lessons at first, because I didn't want to put the pressure, pressure on the staff who, if I'm honest, have been absolutely stars working um, eight till five every single day, ringing every single child up every single week, making sure we're keeping in contact and the biggest thing for us was in the first few weeks was safeguarding and we needed to make sure our children were safe because that's a the key issue i felt at that time and as time's gone on different faculty leaders and, and and teachers have said i'd like to try and do some live learning am i allowed to so we've developed protocols we've done some lessons some are doing pre-recorded lessons so they then put them on as recorded lessons and i'm leaving it down to the individuals to get confidence with it rather than force it what i don't want to do is create any more anxiety so no, we don't have many people who are techni techni uh, techn technophobes, I'll get the word out. Um, there are still some who are like in that way. And I don't want them to feel that they're falling behind everybody else when we haven't actually got the time or, or space to give them the training and development they need. So I think it's, that, it's all gra organically growing here quite quickly. And probably we've got 10 or 12 teachers already out of 70 who are doing live lessons. We're now doing more pastoral meetings on Zoom with our, our young people. Set all safeguard and make sure we've got that around where it used to be just phone calls. So has as time's gone on, we've got more used to the technology and adapted our way. And I think that's probably a more important thing is the step-by-step -step approach rather than go boom, do it all. We weren't ready for that. No, absolutely. You're 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 really right. That organic approach, even during a very difficult time like this, of not you're not solely relying on content, you're selecting it as you would in your as your teachers and your staff would during their normal lessons, right? And then you will see that natural step towards embracing more technology. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Mark. That's fascinating. And Nick, same question for you then. Um, the use um, of technology in education, how it's changed for you? Um, so I, I, mean, I think the first thing is pick up on the safeguarding angle. So we, obviously, that's one of the, the first, the most immediate concerns that a lot of our staff had about you know, the potential of doing live lessons. And previously, the safeguarding policy would have expanded you know, expressly said no you must not be mm. talking with students online so we've had yeah. to change our safeguarding policy and our protocols and we've done that with you know, staff students and parents so we've got a different set of protocols for each of those 
um, key stakeholders, yeah, as it were. And, and that was shared quite a long time in advance. So we've actually got a clear set of rules. And then we gave staff the express permission, if you like, that, and changed the safeguarding policy to allow that to happen. Uh, we didn't put pressure on staff to, that they had to do live lessons. We, um, yeah, we gave them, because they already had the tools, yeah, so we gave them the training to be able to do either, uh, with the view that actually we wanted to keep, keep particularly the exam classes moving. Um, so yeah, some kind of like lesson and yeah, interaction with the teacher. A lot of us have you know, quickly realised that actually the recorded lessons take three times longer than just doing it live. So they've mo they've moved naturally more towards the live lessons because you know they worry about editing and how they sound and every little minor mistake they go back over and change again. And, and I say, and you know, like Mark said, I have to praise my staff. They've been absolutely fantastic at rising to this challenge. That you know, you know, that we have, yeah, you know, sort of like you know, lessons going on, you know, nine to four every single day. You know, we've kept all of our classes going. We've run a full timetable. Yeah, you know, parents have been happy. It's not ideal, but actually, you know, we feel that actually they have continued to progress. And I think the other important thing about sort of like how we've we've approached this is that sometimes you can look at you know, one tool and try to do everything through one place um, and we've not done that so we've done the right tool for the right job so we have you know, particular tools like show we we use for you know handing in and setting assignments and things which enables our staff to be able to get in and give the feedback encouraging staff to give verbal feedback on work to save them the time because it generates a lot more work you know remote learning because you're having to mm. review everything that they're doing because there's because you're not having that group interaction the students are producing more work we're finding um, yeah and then also then using like the century for bits of intervention it's so we've been lucky we've been able to identify different tools and use the right tool for the right job and yeah and that's all technology is at the end of the day it's you know it's a tool to help learning absolutely it's fascinating what you said about i hadn't really thought about the amount of effort it takes to record something. You're essentially producing a, a film for your learners, whereas teaching from my experience as an ex-teacher is it's immediate and you want to react to your learners in real time. Um, so yeah, it, it, you're, you're right as well. I think all three of you demonstrate something very clear though, that there's no way were schools closed during lockdown. The, the oh, pressure and work that your all of your staff have been under is extraordinary. Um, I guess this this brings to another question that I think we're all is at the forefront of our minds at the moment, especially with the news currently, is that if there is a second peak um, or if we see more regional shutdowns, um, how do you plan on managing a mixture potentially of on site and off site? Um, you know, it's been quite clear recently that it was one one of them as off site. Uh, maybe with key worker children on site, but how would you manage, say, 50% in school and out school, um, out of school, sorry. Um, so, Laura, do you want to um, have a go at that one first? Yeah, I think it, we would continue in, the, in a similar way to what we've been doing now in terms of um, you would have some level of content in terms of sharing it amongst the staff because, like we said, the staff have been amazing. Um, so what you would do is share share that content and if we go down the live lesson route they can access the live learning as it's happening for their class I think in terms of the what's been just out hot off the press news today is that the expectation is is that we're going to fully reopen um, but you, like you say we have a another challenging peak and children have to be partly at home there are always we, we always find a way as educators we you know we always find a way what we do and like everybody else has said our staff just embrace things teachers have been knocking short of fantastic at this moment in time so we would look at maybe using that live lesson front but until that that challenge really does present itself we will we'd work with our local authority the public health to make sure that we were doing the right things at the right time as well excellent and can i ask a follow-up question as well which i'll ask to the rest of you is a term blended learning that you know i heard a lot when i started teaching and or hybrid learning as it may be called now and just to ask really what what does this mean to you and your school because i don't think there's necessarily a definition everyone will agree with um, so Laura, in your school, what would blended learning look like if it's a, a term you use at all? 
Yeah, it is a term. And I think, like you say, a lot of people use the term either blended learning or hybrid learning. But for us, it's the learning anytime, anywhere and giving children an opportunity to guide their own learning, lead their own learning, whilst also having their teacher as the guide on the side. So for us, it's the balance of what is a traditional face to face interaction with a teacher alongside an online curriculum. So for us, that's what we would see as kind of the blended learning approach where you've got both. Because for us, you can't have just the technology and the technology enhances what the teachers are skilled and trained to do in terms of moving children's learning on. We believe in coaching one-to-one -one with children. They give them, We call it goal time. That's part of a blended learning approach where they work alongside a teacher face-to-face. -face. They will go away and work in an online way on one of the platforms or, or not. Um, and that's for us how we blend the technology and talent of the teachers together. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that sounds like a really good definition, your one. I like it. Um, Mark, um, over to you. So second peak and regional shutdowns and potentially managing uh, on-site and off-site teaching. Well, we've been planning that now for about four, four or five weeks in terms of having four different scenarios in the end, in essence, complete opening, complete closure and two in between uh, uh, models. Our faculties have been in the middle of we readjusting curriculum anyway, so we need a lot of curriculum work this year, readjusting that. So uh, what we've asked them to do is make sure that in all the curriculum areas and each topic they're doing it, they've actually got some online learning attached to each curriculum part the delivery. So actually, if we were to close down now for two weeks, we would have access to online learning as well as paper-based learning automatically from the same documents. So that those who are online learning can be directed to whichever portal it is we're using, simply for English, math, science, other portals, other, other things, but we direct the parents to that and if they haven't got access to it, we've got a paper basis for money to give them the paper that way. And if they're in school, they use um, those resources as well. So it's about using those resources in school as well. So it's not about double planning. It's actually made us to really focus upon our planning, making sure we've got that ready. So when, when we do get the next lockdown, because believe me, we will, because they're saying two cases in schools, schools will have to shut. Uh, if, there's two, if you've got, I've got 1,300, you're not going to tell me there's an outbreak in Hartlepool of, what is it, 80, 90,000 people, we're not going to get one. Mm. Uh, actually, we will shut, so we'll have to go down that line. So um, I think we're ready for it, if I'm honest, far more than we were in the first place. Um, so is that about balance, making sure we've got it, but there's a lot of training in between, we've got to do the staff confidence and the rest of it. In terms of blended learning, I have no idea what it means. Uh, I'm a teacher. I believe you teach young people, you give them access to resources, you provide learning, whether it's online, remote, in school, whatever. And actually, blending just means it's a part of all that together. Excellent. I, I like that definition as well. Um, and, and also, for, for your staff, it, it must be uh, a massive reassurance to know, as you say, with these documents, these curriculums that have been written, that you can switch between one or the other at the drop of a hat. So that must help the uh, motivation for your team. And that they know they're ready. Yeah, well, you can imagine when we when we started on the, the, the rewrite of the curriculum uh, in January, uh, not because the curriculum wasn't right, but we wanted to modify it, get the, the sequencing right, and and make sure it was all correct. Uh, we've always done a traditional key stage three, key stage four, continue to do that. And so when we when we started going into lockdown, we said, well, hold on, if we're going down this route, you need to make sure you've got the online link to it. It was easy to do. Sometimes we get staff to rewrite things, and sometimes we get, oh, we've got all this work again. But actually, they've just got on with it. And I do. I think they do be reassured because now we've been through this lockdown period, they can see the value of it. I think first of all, they couldn't see the value of it, but as soon as we started moving towards this, they could see, oh right, okay, I can see why I was doing it now. And actually, that's really helped. So, in a perverse sort of way, the pandemic and the close close downs helped in terms of making that curriculum more cohesive, whether it's been at school or not at school. And actually, when you think about, we we have. A, a few school refusers. We have school kids who are taught off site in different places. Mm. Actually, will help us with their planning, their curriculum, so they'll be able to be taught elsewhere in the same curriculum because all those documents there are ready for them. So the whole thing is becoming far more um, cohesive for me rather than being little blocks here, little blocks there. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, and Nick, over to you then. Second peak shutdowns, and um, what does yeah. that mean for, for for your school now? So, yeah. Yeah, like Mark said, we, we, 
we spent the last few months planning out lots of different scenarios. We had four scenarios as well, so it'd be interesting to compare the four. Um, now, now we're looking for everyone back, so it's obviously going to be that sort of like you know as many people in as possible. The, you know, the what the DFE have said today is that they do want um, you know if pupils aren't in, they want them to be able to access the lessons, and that's something that we were doing before the lockdown anyway. So having trained staff and how to use like you know online tools and yeah we did have students remoting in from home because they're on the you know, extremely critically vulnerable list to access mm -hmm. the learning while the rest of the class was still in so we'd probably go down that approach still you know, sort of like yeah you know, uh, and with the the way the government has said that teachers are going to be at the front that makes that a bit easier so they're not going to be missing out on lots of group work and interaction that the government's made it clear they want a lot of teaching from the front to start off with so that will yeah, so that sort of you know, pedagogical approach will lend itself nicely to um, being able to either mount a, we have spare iPads, either mount an iPad into the classroom for students at home to be able to feel like they're actually watching the lesson live or for the teacher to be um, you know, screen sharing you know, from their computer you know, so the student can be following on with the lesson from, you know, from home. Um, I think in terms of blended learning, I think actually what it used to mean in terms of you know, a mix of you know, modern pedagogies and various different things, I think actually is, is actually evolved quite a lot during this pandemic. And I think we're going to see a lot more blended learning approaches when we come back into the you come back into school. So the advice given out today was very much that you know, 48 hours for you know, so you know, for contamination, you know, sort of minimisation. So you know, teachers can't wait 48 hours before they mark a set of books. So we're going to have to have, teach, you know, our students are going to have to continue to take pictures of the work they do in the book to hand in electronically for the teachers to mark in the same way that they're doing now. And it's that kind of blended approach with the technology, you know, and, you know, the traditional pedagogy, which we're, you know, we're going to be like forced into doing, um, is going to work very well. And it's those kind of blends that are going to be um, important, those kind of agile solutions. So it's a mix of, some students at home accessing the lesson from home while it's happening live, but also those in the class are going to have to yeah, be interacting with the teacher in a very different way as well. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating just thinking of the incredible amount of detail the three of you have had to go into, even down to like you, you just said, Nick, thinking about touching books as a teacher and, and how that technology has to be relied upon in that sense. Um, and the idea of a student kind of, Dialing into a physical class is fascinating as well. Um, and I'd be very keen to know how that goes. Um, I think that's a really int in intriguing way of merging technology. Well, it went well. Our head of English did it um, before, before all the schools were shut. So, you know, her top set English, they were accessing, year 11s were accessing the lesson, you know, from home, you know, because they were shielding whilst all the rest were still in mm. class. So, we, so we've done it. It does work. It's not ideal, but, you know, it's, it's something. Incredible. And we're thinking about that for assemblies and, and all yeah. that collective worship and all the rest of it. I'm presently buying 1,300 pencil cases with all the equipment in because they can't bring their own equipment in or you're going to wash it and clean it each day. Books are fine, but pencils aren't and pens aren't. So all those things that you take for granted, mm. you've got to mm. think about how you're doing. So we're presently trying to find the cheapest option. Is it, is it buy it individually or is it buy it in a pack? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Let alone get them in the building. I don't worry about getting them in the building. Let's get the pens and paper and uh, yeah. everything ready for. Yeah. So, so yeah. the whole, the, the 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 last. I mean, I don't I don't know about the other guys, but I haven't had a day off in thirteen weeks. Whatever. It's <laughs> shut down. And oh I will no. Having, you know, I'll be having the summer hits. But uh, what I will say is, I can't I can't complain for just what the uh, the staff are doing and the kids are doing. It's just they, they've engaged the best they can in what what is a a unique time, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. It's clear from all the way you all speak about your stuff, just how far they've gone the extra mile and um, during this time. And I guess really this is perhaps for people listening to this, a question that they will be thinking of. And I'm sure the three of you have spent lots of time thinking about it. It's hard to miss the fact that learning has been missed in some way, um, considerably by some, um, or just the, the style of delivery means there will be more gaps than ever between your students and more extreme for some. And so come September, how are you planning um, to identify these gaps in knowledge and address them as well? Um, so kind of your intervention program, I would, I would say that question is leading towards. Um, they're, they're, when answering this question, I guess, think about 
the real pressure points in school, those transition groups up to secondary or your examination classes. Uh, Laura, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, I think for us, fundamentally, teachers are uh, absolutely skilled in finding out what children do not know, what skills they are missing, and plugging those gaps um, and closing the gap. For us, century will be essential for diagnosing for our key stage two children um, because it's swift and um, it's marked it already. Uh, the teachers can use that intelligence. Um, but fundamentally, we're going to carry on doing what we've been doing, um, using our online platforms to, to speed things up and be effective, uh, to get a best balance for all. Uh, but it's important to find out what the children do not know, which is what teachers do, and it's not just facts, what skills the children also need. Um, and that's what teaching and learning is all about. And um, so from that, we will then obviously be putting in targeted interventions where it's needed. But we don't want to lose the balance of a broad curriculum within that. Although I know that that's what's being said publicly, you know. Mm. So that we can look for 2021. And yes, of the curriculum that may not as detailed as before, that doesn't feel quite right in terms of saying that, but we don't want to lose the balance of the other creative subjects and the other subjects that are there. Um, because our staff are skilled at finding out what's missing, finding out the specifics and guiding our children to progress the learning. Absolutely. I think you raise a really interesting point about if you dismiss the other subjects or in the short term at least that could be um for a student the the most enjoyable part of their mm. school of their education other subjects that might get missed behind uh, left behind sorry for a bit so i think yeah you're mm. absolutely right to mention that and bring that up um mark over over to you then this identifying of gaps especially from the way you've been talking you know i feel like there's going to be quite extreme gaps in in your school yeah. in the various cohorts you have I have real issues with people talking about the gaps and having to build gaps and all these kids are falling behind. I have real issues. As a, as a white British male who didn't engage in education particularly well when he was at school, I'm not too sure what I learned in those 13 weeks of being being shut down. So are there real gaps that we wouldn't have been filling anyway for some of the young people is what I'm trying to say there? So there's some young people yep. who as a teenager wouldn't be engaged and then we would have to fill those gaps anyway. Then you've got your very able who are who are just engaged who are i mean i've got students who are doing hours and hours and hours. my own son does hours and hours and hours of learning and or both of them do if i'm honest uh doing really well and i've got lots of those students who are doing that and then you've got those in the middle and i think it's the middle we're talking about not not your far extreme i think it's a middle group yep. about understanding knowledge so what we've done with year 10 so far is we, we've now had everyone that's had an individual interview since we were allowed to get them in so 240 young people have been brought in for individual meetings they're now coming for lessons where they're getting uh, nine of them in a room. But that is based upon where they have told us they have struggled with their work. So if someone's doing GCSE PE and told us they've struggled with the content, that is the lesson they're getting with the teacher. If they told us it's English or maths, that's what they're getting. And as we go through, we're identifying that work with them. Year six, um, we're coming up into year seven. I've got 275 coming up into year seven next year. Uh, we're about to deliver our transition packs, which we would normally give them in a two weeks transition. Will there be any gaps? Dare, dare, dare I be uh, to say that, you know, in primary schools from May to July, is there in-depth learning around all the curriculum areas? Yes. I know Laura would give it probably a <laughs> face there. So actually, actually, they've got a lot of their, lot of their based learning going on, and, and it does mm -hmm. come to a time when year six, six does relax, and they do start having a good fun time saying goodbye to a school they've been in for seven years. They're still, I'm not saying there's no learning, there's le definitely learning going on. <laughs> but are we missing as much as people making out to me? I think, I think we need mm -hmm. to not over egg this. The biggest issue for me is not about the gaps, it's about young people's mental health. I think we can plug the gaps of teachers, we can find what they don't know, we can use all the tools we've got. Centre is going to be absolutely brilliant in plugging those gaps in independent learning, how it works, uh, in lessons, taking them out of lessons, one to one, instead of having a, an HLTA teacher to use, use te technology. I think we just need to be careful not to overrate as the children start feeling they've fallen behind. If you keep telling someone yeah. they've fallen behind, they'll believe it. And I, I'm not convinced that every child's fallen behind as much as they like that people are making out. And there will be the extremes, but in the middle there, I think we can we can really do a job there and help them support them. 
I think it's fascinating. I think as well, you're right to highlight the middle, like the forgot, potentially children that get forgotten. And also, I think you're right. What we mean by gaps can be taken in many different ways, but just how to learn again, how to be yeah. around a group of young people, how to conduct yourself with teachers again. Well, that um, social distancing, that, that whole process of, of social distancing is going to be really difficult for them to maintain. Mm. And the guidance says we don't have to. And it, just, it doesn't happen in the bubbles. But actually, there are teachers who are going to have to, um, who are going to worry at the anxieties of the teachers about social distancing more than the kids sometimes. And then you've got yeah. children who have, I've got parents who are shielding themselves. How we do that socialization is far, far more important at this stage for me. We can catch those gaps up. Yes, the year 10s, the year 12s, the year 6s are going to be the year groups that are mostly affected. Probably the 10s and 12s are the ones where we work really the most because of the time scales for the exams. But that's now to the government mm -hmm. to look now at what the exams should look like and take into account the changes that happen and, and what's happened to them. So, but you're absolutely right. Just getting used to being in four walls and not being able to go to another room in a secondary school is going to be odd. You know, you know mm -hmm. we move every lesson. We're not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to keep them in one room. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a lot to think about. Um, uh, yeah, Nick, over to you with this, the, the, the catch up, however you want to describe it, the various students, to make sure we get everyone back into learning properly um, in September. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, as we said, we already know who a lot of those students are. Um, you know, we're, we're not doing our inset days in the way that we would normally do our inset days the first two days back in September. So you know, we're going to bring some of those like students that we feel would benefit from coming in with that's for you know, mental health reasons or because they've fallen behind. So they're going to come in those two days and have a bit of a, you know, a catch up program. Um, yes, we're going to get the year, new year sevens in because one of the things that we're worried about is that if we do go to a second lockdown, they're the ones that are most vulnerable because they are the ones that, um, that, that don't have the technology, don't know how to use the, you know, the resources. Uh, so we need to get them caught up to speed you know so we need to plug that gap um sort of first of all um and then it'll just be what will teachers do in the classroom all the time you know sort of like you know you know lots of assessment lots of like you know, finding what those gaps are and teaching to to plug those gaps you know the greatest intervention is always in the classroom and and it will continue to be so uh, you know we have we have the other tools that'll help us you know century is great yeah and teachers will die we'll push them into the different um you know areas that will help them yeah, it's a really good thing to bring up actually focusing on a cohort of learners that aren't that, that can't just engage with technology at the drop of a hat and suddenly learn via zoom or whatever you're right to bring that up it's interesting that there are different versions of what kind of leaders think of to mean gaps um and you're right if a second lockdown happens if your new year sevens are not prepared um they're not going to get the same quality of education that others in your school would. Um, thank you. And this is the last question. It's a very open-ended one. I'd be fascinated to know how you all approach it. Um, Laura, we'll start with you. Uh, what you've gone through um, the last five months or so uh, and in thinking of the preparations for September, uh, what advice would you give to school leaders to help them prepare um, for the next academic year? I think um, it's supporting your culture, going what to each of us have said in terms of teaching children to learn again, find those and revisit those positive learning habits, learn how to learn uh, before approaching the actual strict academics is working on their personal social skills um, and having that known and understood by all that that's kind of the approach that you're taking um, one of the things we do here is some of our little children obviously who struggle sometimes with our social distancing do self-hugging so they do this <laughs> and the teacher does that too um, and there's kind of medical things around that that they still get something from it as if they were to hug mm. that member of staff and um, routine and guidance Everybody likes boundaries. In the school and education environment, teachers, staff, children, parents, everybody likes to know what the routine and boundaries are. So just create what that culture is, your sense of community, and allow your children to belong again. Um, for us, in terms of the technology, we would say that now we're in a place where our three different schools currently on this webinar are all at different stages in digital journeys. 
um, but to maximize on the technology that's out there. Um, and we would say use, keep it simple, use as little as possible, as in use what you need for a specific thing, but don't say have 12 different platforms that you're using because it can be too confusing. Keep it simple for the children, for the staff, for the parents, and whatever you do, be consistent and rigorous in its delivery. Um, but that balanced with supporting our children's emotional and mental health at this time is absolutely crucial, as well as the families. Absolutely. Laura, thank you. That's wonderful advice. Very clear. Uh, Mark, over to you. Advice. The only, the, 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 there's only one, some of it, I, I, I agree with most of what Laura, if not all what Laura said there. The only advice I would have different is reflect on how it's been for you at home as a leader. And if you've been working at home at all, reflect how hard it is for you and imagine what it's like not to live in your home. But to live in a home where you might be in a shared bedroom, where you might not have a space to learn in, where you might not have an internet, or you may have three or four others running around demanding the access to your computer. And just remember how hard that is. And then you can plan properly. If you think everybody lives in your world, then you've got to think differently. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more with that, um, especially um, with the stories you've been telling today of you know, the children that you support. Um, Nick, over to you. Advice for, for leaders um, um, so getting ready I, for I, September. I, yeah, I would agree with you know, both what you know, Laura and Mark have said already. I think one of the key things for leaders is, you know, is you know, make a plan early and you know, invest, invest in training your staff and you know, get your staff on board um, by training them, giving them the skills they need. So you know, we were lucky. We started planning for this in February. We, you know, we, we anticipated the closure quite early. You know, we started with you know, light touch training with instructional videos to start off with and then lots and lots of face-to-face -face, uh, training and then people trying it out, you know, so, yeah, and training the students in much the same way. So we had, we talked about remote assemblies earlier. We actually had our head of sixth form stood in the great hall where they would have been gathered on his own delivering an assembly while Amazing. all the sixth formers and the teachers, you know, sort of signed in to, you know, to test how it would actually work. So, there's lots of things you can do to get ready, but you know, just lo just invest in training the staff to make them confident. Because the more they're confident, the greater success you'll have with it. And you know, and yeah, you know, Mark said, you know, just just be patient, and you know, I suppose reach out. You know, there are plenty of people out there who've you've know, gone through this you know, the technology journey, and we're all happy to give our time freely to help you know colleagues in other places. Brilliant. Well, I think all three of you have helped colleagues um, who watch this today. Um, so thank you on behalf of Century. Thank you for your time um, going through that. And also it's lovely to hear you talk about your staff and your students and how hard everyone's worked and clearly how hard the three of you have worked as well over the last however many months it's been. <laughs> um, so look, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, thank you for your stories and sharing everything with us. And I'm sure we'll do this again. Um, but yeah, on behalf of Century, thank you ever so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.